my name is Simon Tank. Uh, I'm the, the moderator of this uh, China-Russia-Africa panel. I serve as a lecturer at the Cal State uh, Fullerton and specializing in international relations and comparative politics. Uh, it is my great privilege and honor to introduce our esteemed uh, panelists, Dr. Heidi Hart, <laughs> and Dr. Kaliji Kalu, I pronounce it right, yes. and uh, Dr. Teresa Wright. Okay. Um, let me have a very brief introduction to uh, the three uh, esteemed uh, panelists. Um, I'm going to skip all the achievements that they have uh, accomplished, so you can read uh, the readout. I'm going to go straight toward their specialty and also the topic they're going to talk about. Uh, Dr. Heidi uh, Hart is an associate professor of political science at the uh, University of California, Irvine. And her research, uh, research focuses on the transatlantic uh, security, European security and the defense, and also explores various aspects of uh, NATO, the EU, and OSCE, which stands for Organization for Security and uh, Cooperation in Europe. And uh, Dr. High's speech will offer updates and analysis regarding NATO's uh, relation with China and Russia, focused particularly on development following the invasion of Ukraine. Thank you. I give up. I got to get up glasses. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to know what you are. I mean, you know, a man got to know his limitation. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kalichi Kalu is a professor of political science at the University of California, Riverside. And uh, his research and teaching interests are international politics, African political economy, and the U.S. Africa relations. And Dr. Kalu's speech will address China's and Russia's strategic engagement in Africa. Now, Dr. Uh, Teresa Wright is a professor of political science at California State University, Long Beach, which I also teach, so I'm proud to call you my colleague. Thank you. And Dr. Wright's research focuses on the state society relation, protests, and dissent and the relationship between uh, capitalism and democracy, particularly in China and Taiwan. Uh, Dr. Wright's speech will explore China's complex uh, domestic economics, societal, uh, political landscape, providing insight for prediction for its future. Uh, she will also evaluate the impact of Belt and Road Initiative on China's domestic situation. Anyway, uh, Cal State University Fullerton Political Science Department uh, stressed the importance of understanding domestic affairs to fully comprehend the dynamics of international relations. Therefore, Dr. Wright will initiate today's discussion as our first presenter. Please join us um, to join me in extending one welcome to all three of them. Can everybody hear me all right? Well, thank you, Dr. Tong, for the very kind introduction and for the invitation to come and speak with you all today, learn from you, learn from our fellow panelists here. I just want to say a few words, uh, mostly focusing on China and its domestic political situation, but um, make a few comments also that relate to China's foreign affairs. To start off, when you think of China, I want you to think of the three C's. The first C is complexity, the second is comparison, and the third is change. When you read Western media reports about the domestic situation in, in China and China, China's foreign relations, you often get a simplified vision of the actual situation in China. And oftentimes the focus is only on the negative aspects of China's domestic situation. 
The focus is on Xi Jinping as an increasingly dictatorial leader, further amassing political power. Focus in media reports often is on the repression of China's citizenry and freedoms, and also a focus on the economic struggles of Chinese people and the Chinese economy as a whole. And those aspects of China's domestic situation are certainly real and important, but if we only focus on those negative aspects, we're missing the complexity, the reality of the situation domestically in China in a more nuanced kind of perspective. So I wanna talk about a few aspects of the domestic situation in China, and especially with regard to relations between Chinese members of Chinese society and the Chinese party state, aspects that aren't as well covered in most of the media reports that we get. So yes, it is absolutely true that Xi Jinping has been amassing power during the quite long time now that he has been in the top position within the Chinese Communist Party and holding the position of president of the People's Republic of China. But a few things to kind of complicate the picture. Everybody here probably knows that the uh, term limit for the president of China position was extended for Xi Jinping, or I should say removed for Xi Jinping. What is often not noted, and I, I do think this is an important aspect of how this happened, is that this change actually occurred through a constitutional process. So the Chinese state does have a constitution, and the process by which term limits were removed for the position of president of the PRC did occur through a constitutional process rather than it simply being the case that Xi Jinping just declared that I am president for life and nobody could do anything about it. A second aspect of complexity. It is true that today in China and for quite some time there has been little to no formal organized political dissent and it is absolutely the case that political repression has increased under Xi Jinping. At the same time, what many people in the West don't realize is that popular protests are extremely frequent across the country as a whole. They are typically not focused on national political issues or political reform, a, a very unusual occurrence uh, that was more overtly political occurred in late 2022. You've probably heard about those protests that occurred, but those were really an unusual aberration. Instead, we've seen typically from year to year thousands of public protests, but they've been related to other kinds of issues like environmental issues, labor issues, and these often involve thousands of people, can become very violent. And so my point is that protest is actually quite frequent and pervasive, even though organized political dissent is more or less non-existent. We're also aware, and rightly so, of censorship in China, especially online and social media. But at the same time, it is also true that there is a very vibrant and lively culture of online sarcasm, puns, even overt political crit criticism in China. So it's not the case that there is no kind of discussion of criticism of the Chinese Communist Party and or its leaders. Uh, I also want to emphasize that despite the fact that Xi Jinping has increased repression during the time that he has been in the top positions within the party and the state, it is easier to stay in power if people are happy 
with the job that a government is doing rather than by just ruling by fear. So alongside increased repression, Xi Jinping, like most of the other uh, the top leaders of the party and state in the post-Mao period, has also engaged in efforts that have been very warmly received by the public, like a massive anti-corruption campaign and also a, man, a massive anti-poverty campaign that many people uh, appreciate and have benefited from. Under Xi Jinping, the party has also increased its efforts to improve the quality of China's natural environment. And this is something that regular people have experienced on a daily basis and that is a very important aspect of the quality of people's lives. Also important to remember that at present, for most Chinese people, there is no sense that there is a preferable, viable alternative to Chinese Communist Party rule. So as much as people might be dissatisfied with many aspects of the Chinese political system and even Xi Jinping, if there's nothing better that is viable waiting in the wings, then I think for many people, the conclusion is it's better to just try to make the best of the situation as is. Now, in terms of comparison, it's also important to think about China in comparison to other countries in terms of its, the government's political performance and the provision of public welfare benefits. It's also important to think about what we're comparing the current Chinese government to. Are we comparing it to the Hu Jintao era, the Deng Xiaoping era, or are we comparing it to the Maoist period? So depending on what your comparison is, it can change your understanding of are things getting better, are they worse, et cetera. The same is true with things like China's military spending. Right now, the Chinese uh, political system is having a big meeting of the National People's Congress. And one thing that was announced is that the Chinese defense budget will be rising by seven some percent. So that's a big increase. It's something that we need to take note of. But at the same time, we need to think comparatively and I'm sure most of you in this room are aware that if you compare even the Chinese defense budget and you add 7% to that, it would still be a tiny fraction of what the United States spends on defense. Also important to think about change in this regard as well, that whatever you see at the present time in China does not necessarily denote what will continue to be the case in the future. And Dr. Tong said I would offer predictions, but I'm actually not going to offer <laughs> predictions. I stopped offering predictions after I read a study that looked at the predictions of experts versus the predictions of lay people. And the conclusion was that lay people were more often correct in their <laughs> predictions. So I've sworn off predictions ever since that time. But I do think it's important to remember that what we see now does not necessarily denote what will persist into the future. And I think those protests that, that sprung up in late 2022 were a very good example of that. We were shocked and it included some people saying publicly things like down with Xi Jinping and down with the Chinese Communist Party. And if you had asked me a few weeks earlier if that was possible, I'd say I highly doubt that that would happen. So let me turn just for a couple of minutes to the Belt and Road Initiative. We got a really great introduction to that from our student presenters and from Congressman Royce's presentation just a few minutes ago. What I want to emphasize here is the complexity 
of the Belt and Road Initiative? Is it threatening? Is it harmful? Is it beneficial? It can be a lot of things all at once. And I think the, uh, one of the students mentioned that the research that's been done on the Belt and Road Initiative is divided in terms of whether or not it has been beneficial or not. And we also have to ask the question, beneficial to, to who? To the leadership of the host country, to the regular people, of the host country to other foreign powers. Uh, we also heard the presentation uh, that talked about kind of quality of life indicators, so things like power plants being built or schools being built. Uh, even if there might be some kind of more nefarious intent underneath that kind of investment, still it's hard to argue that building schools is a bad thing. So we have to understand the Belt and Road Initiative in all of its complexity, and also in terms of change over time. And one change that I would emphasize is that the, the shift in focus toward more green technology and more environmentally friendly projects as part of the Belt and Road Initiative and this is also an example of the Chinese regime being able to change policy when it gets negative feedback. So when uh, there has been negative feedback, like protests and criticisms related to Belt and Road Initiative projects, typically the regime has shifted in response. We saw the same thing, by the way, domestically in the fall of 2022 in China, when those protests broke out, they were mostly focused on criticizing the harsh zero COVID policies of the regime and almost overnight, those policies were completely reversed. So even though the Chinese regime, I think can be rightly called authoritarian and certainly under Xi Jinping, <clears throat> the authoritarian features of the Chinese party state have become more so. We still have to remember the potential for change, even kind of rapid unexpected change, like the abandonment of zero COVID policies, and also the responsiveness of the regime, especially getting back to this idea that it's easier for a regime to stay in power if people are happy with the job that the government is doing than by sheer repression. And just to close, I want to make a plea for two uh, perspectives or two ways of thinking about China. One is I hope that everyone will beware of letting what we want to believe color our understanding of a situation. So if we want to believe that the Chinese government and Xi Jinping are pure evil, then we might not want to accept information or evidence that challenges that understanding. So beware of seeing what you want to see when you look to China. And then secondly, and somewhat related to that, be careful of what you wish for. And Think carefully about that. I think many people kind of wish for bad news about China. Oh, the Chinese economy is faltering. There are people protesting against Xi Jinping. But I don't think we follow through. What do we really want? Do we want the Chinese Communist Party to fall? If it fell, would things be better? Would it, they be better for the United States? Would they be better for the Chinese people? Again, because there is no viable or preferable alternative to Chinese Communist Party rule at present, what might come after the fall of the Chinese Communist Party could be far worse, far more chaotic and destabilizing than what we see now. So just to reiterate, uh, when you think of China, think of complexity, comparison, and change.
Thank you very much. Uh, if I may add, um, I don't know how to speak French, but uh, Louis XV one time said, after us flood, right? Deluge, right, he has used it. So I agree with you. We need to uh, really uh, watch carefully and uh, reserve our comment about the China's future. Now, uh, also with my big honor, a uh, great honor to um, introduce uh, Dr. Heidi Hart for our next presenter. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, as you heard, I'm a political science professor at University of California, Irvine. Um, my research, uh, my recent research has really been interested in change within NATO. Um, I uh, have done a lot of work on, as you heard, transatlantic security, um, international organizations, and a lot of the bureaucratic politics within those organizations. Um, and I had the privilege of spending a year working uh, for and serving the U.S. government uh, from 2021 to 2022. Um, I had no idea, of course, that this, um, this time in government was going to be um, really a, a crisis point uh, and that we were going to experience the exogenous uh, shock, which was, um, you know, the full scale of invasion of Ukraine. Um, but it was uh, very illuminating uh, because I arrived two weeks before um, the war broke out. I arrived in the, on the NATO desk at the State Department. Um, and so I thought it might be helpful to talk a little bit about some of the expectations and assumptions we had before and what we've seen after. Um, and I'll probably speak more to the U.S.-Russia relations, NATO-Russia relations more than um, with the PRC, but I can speak really briefly on that as well. Um, so some of the points that I'm going to say, you've already heard from Congress, uh, Congressman uh, Royce. So uh, it may, so some of these themes may be a little bit familiar, and then you know, some of the other parts will, will be different. But the first thing that I wanted to say in preparing these notes is that today a growing number of Americans believe that sending aid to Ukraine is a waste of money. It uh, is a quote unquote poor return on investment. So many of the talks that I've given related to NATO, Russia, Ukraine, I, you know, privately and talking to folks such as yourselves, I hear that return on investment. What's our return on investment? And generally the view of the war itself, if I think about my students, um, as having really no relevance to their lives. Um, and I think, you know, uh, Congressman, uh, Congressman uh, Royce already made quite a, a, quite a good point on this, but I really want to emphasize that in reality, continuing to aid Ukraine is likely one of the most effective ways of ensuring U.S. national security. Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine two years ago was, uh, you know, I think it's pretty easy to say, one of the greatest um, international breaches of sovereignty that we've seen since World War II. Um, this was very, very unusual. Um, and there's obviously we could debate whether or not that was really the beginning of the war, right? Because in 2014, um, the arrival of the quote unquote little green men, there was already uh, you know, troops, unmarked Russian troops arriving in Crimea, and then the subsequent um, illegal, uh, I would say, and highly contested uh, Russian annexation of, uh, of Crimea. Um, and to me, the, the biggest threat that we see, in addition to the obvious one, which is the tremendous loss of life, and the continued tremendous loss of life in that country and in that region um, is that other countries may be next. This may just be only the beginning. And please, I hope that I'm wrong, right? Uh, <laughs> um, if Russia wins the war, right, or even continues in the, the path that we're seeing, um, and if it truly does become a, a stalemate, um, the consequences for the US in particular um, could include an, a further expansion of the already huge refugee crisis. We've seen 6.5 million Ukrainian refugees thus far. There have obviously also been uh, Russian um, refugees. Higher food and gas prices. If you're concerned about you know, the energy crisis right now, imagine what would, things would look like if war in Europe were to spread. Um, potentially increased risks to terrorism due to instability. Um, you know, I mentioned loss of life, but particularly on International Women's Day, it's important to recognize, uh, you know, sexual and gender-based violence. That's very much absent from the discourse if you're kind of reading the news regularly and up to date on the news. But that has also been a very key part of this uh, of this war, and is has been acknowledged in international law. 
um, as uh, you know, as really a, a violation um, of uh, of human rights, and um, really been used as a as a tool of war in itself. Um, you know, there's also the the very dangerous risk of precedent. So, you know, when I talk to my students or when I'm talking to colleagues about this issue, the concern is, okay, so maybe there will be, you know, some bump, some, you know, some economic consequences for us. Okay, so maybe we have to absorb some more uh, refugees. Um, but, you know, there's, there are many conflicts that are going on in the world, right? What, what makes the, the crisis in Ukraine special? Um, and I think it's important to think about that precedent, right? So again, you know, we are not the only ones that are observing what's happening in Ukraine. Um, you know, autocratic regimes, um, you know, countries around the world are paying attention to this. And so when you hear that term, the rules-based order, I immediately think of international institutions. And I think of, you know, the decades upon decades of efforts uh, by countries to try to come up with some common set of rules um, one of which is pretty important, which is the norm of non-intervention, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, I was one of probably many scholars and experts out there um, who assumed that full-scale invasions, particularly by great powers of other countries, was, was sort of a thing of the past. And now we see that's not the case, right? Russia has proved us wrong. So it's important to remember that other countries may be paying attention to that. So if you know, we all kind of look at this and say, well, you know, that's happening far away. That doesn't have to do with us. Which, which countries are going to be next, right? Which great power is going to invade which country next? Um, and so there is a, a really value, uh, valuable uh, thing about remembering the, you know, the value of this international rules-based order that for decades, um, you know, people across different political parties, right, from different backgrounds have really worked hard to to reinforce. Um, and all it takes is one powerful precedent to put this all at risk. Now, I would be the first to say international organizations, uh, or more broadly, international institutions are not perfect. Um, I'm a scholar, I'm very grateful to have academic freedom. So, um, and much of my research, you know, my, my last book on, uh, which is called NATO's Lessons in Crisis, interviewed many, many officials across the NATO community and certainly make some criticisms. Um, but I think there is value in having those institutions because those institutions provide opportunities for people to, um, to have dialogue. And one of the things that I was just talking to my grad students about the other day in uh, my conflict class was that much of conflict prevention that goes on, we never see, right? It's not observed by us because it's happening in the corridors, it's happening over coffees, it's happening um, in you know, the, the context of these international institutions, which we see many people in the media be very quick to not just criticize, but suggest that we should you know, eliminate or withdraw from and, and pull out of. Um, and that, you know, that's not good for PR, right? If you don't see the wins. Um, but that's the reality of how many of these um, you know, international institutions work. Um, on you know, thinking a little bit about Russian motivation, um, you know, I think it's it's important. We heard uh, Congressman Royce did a great job talking to us a little bit about the messaging that we've heard. Um, but the denial of Ukraine sovereignty has been a consistent theme. That's not something that's relatively new, and also something that you've seen uh, for other countries as well that were for a part of the you know part of the uh, of the um, Soviet Union. Um, we see you know continues uh, continued themes of silencing domestic opposition. Um, right, with the only, you know, think, speaking of the you know, viability of opposition parties or opposition leaders, this person, uh, you know, no longer exists um, in, in the context of Russia. Um, and efforts explicitly in that Russian rhetoric to reunify the Soviet Union. So you see these kind of broader imperialist um, ambitions. Um, but part of this has also been, uh, you know, a story about NATO, right? So in when I was uh, there in those two weeks, like I said, leading up to um, to the invasion, you know, the U.S. government, many governments around the world were trying to do everything they could to, uh, you know, call Putin out on his bluff and prevent this from happening. Um, you know, you're, you can think about those columns of tanks that were coming that, you know, were part of an exercise that never quite ended. And it's very common for countries to have military exercises, but that particular one just didn't end, right? The tanks and 
all of the equipment didn't go back to uh, you know where they, they came from. And so there was a lot of concern about what was um, going to happen. And part of the, um, the narrative and kind of the false narratives that was coming out of those couple weeks from Russia was, well, um, you know, Ukraine is on the brink of joining NATO, right? And that is a direct threat to our sphere of influence. This is about to happen. Um, and, you know, I, I'm just here to be one of many voices that have said already that there was no evidence at the time that that was the case. I would say the opposite. Um, you know, this was not a situation where Ukraine was suddenly about to be uh, brought into NATO overnight. Um, yes, absolutely. In 2008, there, you know, we saw this uh, at the summit and the agreements that Ukraine will one day become a member of NATO. But in that moment, we're talking about, you know, January, February 2022, there was no evidence that this was, uh, you know, that Ukraine was about to be brought in. So there wasn't some sort of threat. And I would just say that even if there had been evidence, it's up to every country to decide, you know, which international organizations they want to join. Um, and so, you know, with thinking of the UN Charter and all of the many international agreements um, that, uh, you know, Budapest Memorandum, et cetera, that Russia itself had signed, um, it was very clear that, uh, you know, that, that the idea of invading a sovereign country was in strict violation of many multiple international um, laws. Um, you know, unfortunately, the 2014 incursion, just to go back a little bit, of, uh, of Ukraine really was a, a, a shifting point in terms of US relations with NATO and more broadly, allies' relations with NATO. Um, and I think it's useful to, to keep in mind that prior to that, what was interesting is that NATO was actually, uh, excuse me, Russia was actually a partner of NATO. And in fact, technically, if you looked at NATO's websites or, or documents and things like that, Russia continued to be a partner um, of NATO, which is kind of an official designation, um, all the way up until 2022. Um, but in 2014, of course, with this incursion of uh, Ukraine, you know, NATO was quick to, to, uh, to condemn this. And we saw the beginnings of what we're now seeing are really bolstering what's called the Eastern flank, right? The kind of Eastern countries um, in Europe and seeing the introduction of these rotational um, battalions that are sent out to try to help um, with deterrence and, and patrolling um, across multiple domains, right? Not just, uh, you know, not just the land. Um, but, you know, prior to that 2014 point, you know, as partner status, um, that, there was a real visceral aspect to that. So, for example, um, if you were to go to NATO headquarters in, I don't know, 2010 or 20, you know, 2009, early 2000s, you would physically see a little office which had a bunch of NATO's partners. Um, and, you know, Russia was there and Ukraine is there and, you know, other partners had physical presence, a permanent presence at NATO headquarters, just to indicate how much effort there was to try to engage in cooperative security and shared, um, shared threats and trying to tackle shared threats together during that period, right? And that kind of maybe came out of, um, you could go back to the Clinton administration and earlier efforts that was happening simultaneously with broader efforts at um, arms control um, discussions, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's kind of strange to think about now uh, when we think about relations with Russia, but there was a period in that post-Cold War where there were a lot of um, you know, real concerted efforts, confidence building um, to, to really uh, have, a, have, a, have a more positive relationship. Um, but unfortunately, we've seen the demise of um, something that's personally most, most distressing, I would say, in addition to the huge loss of life, has been the collapse of so many arms control agreements, right? INF, open skies. Um, most recently, you know, what, what I was told, you know, when I was at the State Department, one of the most critical treaties, um, CFE, which is a, basically a treaty that laid out, um, you know, again, a product of the Cold War, laid out very specific um, uh, reporting mechanisms to ensure that, you know, as uh, tanks are moving and things like this along that, um, you know, what I guess we would call the Iron Curtain, um, that Russia and then, you know, uh, many of the European states, Eastern European states, um, the Caucasus, et cetera, were very, um, were as transparent as possible about those movements. And so that, even that treaty is now, um, you know, is now effectively dead. We could talk about the NATO-Russian founding, founding act, et cetera. 
So we do still have new start, which is one thing. So uh, if you have members of Congress, maybe support them <laughs> in, uh, you know, because in, in two years that's gonna run out, but that's, that's one of the last big ones that's out there. Um, I would just say that um, on this think, thinking a little bit about how Ukraine, um, the, the Ukraine war in particular has changed the NATO's relations with the PRC, um, it's very complicated, right? I really appreciated the points that you were making. Um, it's complicated on the domestic level, it's complicated on the foreign policy level because of, of course, how um, inter economically interdependent many allies, I would say, including the US, is on, um, you know, on China, right? And all of the history of the trade relations, um, some, of, some NATO allies are part of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative that we heard about, some of them are not. Um, some of these uh, NATO allies have very strong opinions about, um, you know, things like 5G and Huawei and et cetera, and some of them, you know, feel, feel the opposite. Um, and so this is why if you look back at kind of the high level documents that NATO has put out, you'll see this movement of, um, okay, so China presents quote unquote opportunities and challenges to then suddenly you see that the language that was used in those, these really important political documents after um, 2022, expanding to concerns about coercive behavior, concerns about investments in critical infrastructure. This is something the US government and many governments are very concerned about, espionage, et cetera, making sure that procurement um, is less dependent on uh, uh, PRC parts, particularly for you know, critical infrastructure like ports, um, uh, military bases, equipment on military bases, et cetera. Um, but you know, one of the other things that we saw that the PRC did, or I should say more specifically, because I, I really respect the point that you're making about maybe we shouldn't treat China or the PRC government as a block, right? We should think about this in, in more of a complexity, but several of the um, high level uh, Chinese government uh, officials in the days after that um, invasion retweeted basically Russian talking points on what was going on. And so that was very uh, you know, complicated and, and that really um, uh, challenged the relationship that was what was going on. Since of course allies were reaching out at that time to China as another great power to say, hey, you know, shouldn't we be reinforcing this rules-based order? Here we see this very obvious uh, you know, tragedy that's unfolding that's morally and ethically wrong, but also happens to violate all these things. Will you come with us in, uh, in condemning this? And so we see um, kind of a demure uh, response by the PRC to not necessarily full out condemn, but then sometimes we see things that sound like condemnation, but then sometimes the talking points seem to be reflections of, of um, you know, Russia's position on this, and that, that has, has further um, complicated the relations. Um, you know, to, to conclude, I think the things that I would just say to pay attention to is, um, you know, what can the U.S. do right now to convince allies and also to convince Russia that this Article 5 commitment that you hear about, right, which is that commitment to collective defense, is truly ironclad. So the way deterrence works is it only works <laughs> to the extent to which people believe it's true, right? And so when you hear things like a former U.S. president saying, Russia, do whatever you want. If I get elected, do whatever you want. That is, is really problematic because that's challenging this collective defense agreement that is meant certainly as protecting allies that are part of this alliance, but it's also meant to be a signal externally to say, you know, please do not try, do not test the, the alliance and the collective defense of the alliance. So it puts to question the US credibility piece um, in this. So things that we should be looking for is who's gonna be the next president, right? Is the next president um, going to be <coughs> someone who is inviting attacks or is who's somewhat um, ambivalent or maybe, maybe even apathetic to um, expansion of war in Europe? Um, is it going to be someone who is reinforcing the rules-based order? What does that look like and how will that affect, that decision affect um, you know, relations among you know, the, the US and Russia and among the US and China? but also kind of broader implications for the rules-based order itself and the survival of these international institutions. And then also, is Congress going to continue funding aid to Ukraine or not? 
And what does that look like? And what about refugees? What about us, you know, in terms of our uh, support for people that are coming to this country, whether it's Ukrainian refugees or Afghan refugees, et cetera. Um, ultimately, you know, aid, particularly military aid, has come down to becoming a, a war of logistics. We heard Congressman Royce talk about um, arms, artillery. Um, uh, what does this look like? What is necessary to keep uh, Ukraine going at this point? Um, so these are all kind of things that, that we should be looking for as we're as we're studying and trying to understand what's what's happening in these relationships. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Kalu's speech will address uh, China and Russia's strategic engagement in Africa. Let's welcome Dr. Kalu. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> I couldn't resist. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tan, and to my colleagues for your uh, invitation for me to be here with you. Um, before I delve into looking at China-Russia relationship, I will need to do two things first. One would be to tell you a little bit about my connection to where we are. And secondly, to contextualize the discussion within the framework of United States as a major player in the international system and that connection to Africa. That's the only way it would make sense to really understand what is going on uh, in the continent uh, with Russia's and uh, Chinese presence, including others. Um, a young man leaving primary school in the mid-1970s out of civil war, uh, the Biafra Civil War, I was six years old during that war. I stumbled into a library uh, outside the US Embassy here in Lagos, uh, saw a book, a really thick book, and I loved it. I loved the book. I liked the picture in front of it. It has this seal. The, blue cover, and I got fascinated. I bought the book, Richard Nixon's Memoir. <laughs> I sat down and read the book from page one to the last page, 1,200 and some pages. I was hooked. Why? Um, Richard Nixon, a graduate of Wita College, a graduate of uh, Duke University, dead in his class, very poor, his brother suffering from polio, his mom not, too, not doing too well. Everything he tried, he failed at it. But he never gave up. He continued and became the president of the most powerful country in the world. My question was, which country, which country does a pauper become president? or become a king. That's never done. I want to go to that country. So I gave up all opportunities to go to the United Kingdom and ended up in the US and did some of the things that Richard Nixon talked about in his book, like being a janitor, you know, sweeping floors and mopping floors. I just wanted to understand fully who this person was. This is the power of soft power the power of ideas, the power of principles at play. That's what got me into this country. That's what got me to accept this invitation as an opportunity to visit the library for the first time. Now, when we think about Africa, and this is for the benefit of the students here, for someone like me who has traveled extensively, it's quite distressing. It's quite distressing in this part of the world because um, it's a continent, second largest continent, with well over 2,000 distinct languages. It's a continent with 54, if you count Western Sahara, 55 independent countries. It's a continent that is growing of the 1.25 billion people, 40% are below the age of 15. This is a young country if you think in terms of demographics. So why do we get it so wrong most of the time? 
The point I'm making is if you think about U.S. foreign policy and the opportunity that, has pro that it has provided for China and Russia, the best way to categorize it is policy of benign neglect. That policy of benign neglect goes back to the Berlin Conference. U.S. was not a direct party to the Berlin Conference, but U.S. had Henry Sanford as a representative of the U.S. government and Henry Stanley as the technical advisor. I know this because of the, the Library of Congress where the information is available. These two gentlemen were under the payroll of King Leopold of Belgium, who himself was not invited to the conference. What has he got to do with policy of benign neglect? All King Leopold wanted was United States support for him to get the real estate known as Congo to this day. He got it, but the opportunity was also for Europeans to solve their own internal problem. They did not want to fight over Africans. So beyond slavery, the policy of benign neglect has allowed the United States to mostly listen to Europeans about African issues and approach African issues from European lenses. Now, if you fast forward to the end of the Second World War, Part of that policy of benign neglect, rather than investment, was aid, Truman's four-point plan. It was about aid because African countries were colonial territories at this point. They were not independent. The consequence of that is that Africa is always in need, is always about disease, is always about weakness. To complicate matters, in the State Department, you bifurcate Africa further from the partition in 1884-85. When you hear Africa in this part of the world, you're actually hearing black Africa. Because all of North Africa is linked with the Middle East. So that Egypt gets more foreign aid and investment than Sub-Saharan Africa combined. These are examples of policy of benign neglect. When I think about foreign policy, I go back to the fantastic conceptualization by a former member of the policy planning staff in the State Department, Bruce Gentleson, where he talks about the four Ps, power, prosperity, principles, and peace. Of course, power is about military security, Prosperity is about economic uh, uh, policies, access to resources, principles, which is more dominant in this, has been dominant since the end of the Cold War especially. This is democratic transitions, democratic elections, etc. etc. Peace is what undergirds everything that we want to do, especially in this part of the world. Let me take you just put in a different context what I mean by policy of benign neglect. We have heard about the destabilization of the world and the push from Russia, etc. I think it is a policy of benign neglect that allowed us in 2008 when Russia invaded Georgia. In resolving that conflict, Sarkozy resolved the conflict in favor of, of Moscow. And in fact, France proceeded to sell Moscow menstrual uh, helicopter carrier equipment. When Georgia asked Washington for tanks, anti-air tanks, there was no response from Washington. Uh, excuse me, the response was no. I would argue that policy of benign neglect of our peace tied to Europe is what emboldened Vladimir Putin for his march in 2014 and the subsequent march into Ukraine in 2022. Now, with all this in context about policy of benign neglect, let's come to the continent of Africa. The only place you see United States 
very much present is in Djibouti, the horn, the, in the Horn of Africa. It's not just United States that is in Djibouti. Djibouti is a country of less than one million people. But Russia is there, China is there with air bases, Japan is there, Saudi Arabia is there. When you hear about the Hutus, currently, it is the Chinese vessels off the coast of Djibouti that is are flagging vessels for other countries protecting the Hutus from attacking these vehicles. What is it that we are doing that is making it difficult for us to really fully understand the strategic importance of Africa, instead of just focusing on the Red Sea, on the Mediterranean, and the Gulf of Aden. It's very simple. We don't, I would argue, want to align our policies looking at the internal composition of United States. Because if we create an opportunity for black Americans to align properly with African countries, we might yet not know the outcome. But I think the outcome will be positive. I think the outcome will be positive. Because we don't want to do that, we have continued to allow our companies to represent us in various African countries. We show up mainly in the anti-terrorist policies, coordinating through drones, through engagement with the military. If you look at the Cold War, most US alliances were with non-democratic entities in the continent. And they were mostly with non-Christian countries. Go look at the data. What I'm telling you is Africa has always been looked as a child, as almost lacking agency. This is what created opportunity in 1996 for Jean Zemen to visit the continent. Met with African leaders and offered, let me quote, offered, quote, uh, made a pledge to treat African states as equals, to work toward mutually beneficial development, and to enhance consultations on international affairs. This was a welcome news for African countries. Finally, we get to be treated as equals. But what did not dawn on the leaders is China is doing the same thing the United States has been doing because it's lumping all of the countries together. When you call a meeting in Beijing, everybody goes to Beijing. There is no bilateral, serious bilateral engagement. In addition to that, <clears throat> China provided five billion five billion in loans towards major, reducing down major, US, excuse me, major uh, credit, major debts that African countries owed. China signed agreement with African countries to construct roads, rail lines, and major buildings. As much as I resent this, as much as I have seen from Southern Africa to East Africa, Central and West Africa, I've been all over the places. Many of the projects are useless from my point of view. They are useless because African countries lack the capacity to oversee the construction. But the people on the ground are seeing something different. Where Europeans came, where Americans come and cut off resources without leaving anything. Afri ordinary Africans are seeing roads, no matter how badly constructed these roads are. They are seeing airports constructed. You go to Addis Ababa, the Africa Union building was donated by China. These are the realities. So China's presence is not out of altruism. It's an opportunity as a result of neglect by the West. Russia's engagement with Africa is as a result of China's enormous resources extraction from the continent. Putin started first by, <clears throat> by the way, if you want to read, I wrote a paper on this. I don't, I don't want to read it to you, it's this. But that is something pages. <clears throat> Putin, Russia's 
Russia, lacking China's financial resources and personnel capacity to direct, directly engage African states, used the mercenary Wagner Group in exchange for diamond concessions to protect former Sudanese President Omar al Basir. The Wagner Group has since graduated into fighting jihadists and insurgents in Central Africa, Mozambique, Mali, Burkina Faso. All these will not have happened if we are truly engaged in state building. In state building. I'm not talking about nation building. The continent, the individual countries, have largely been neglected. You can talk about Omar Bongo, you can talk about a Central African Republic, you can talk about Mali. Since the end of the Second World War, France has held Francophone African countries hostage. This is a fact. So when you see what is going on in Mali, in Burkina Faso, in Senegal, Côte d'Ivoire is joining, attempting to push the French out is because France, like her Western friends, neglected the opportunities on the ground for their own interests. These are the things creating inroads for Russia, for China. Should the West seek serious engagement with African countries in order to defeat, quote, or remove African, excuse me, Chinese and Russians out of the continent. It will have to counter what is already happening with visible, concrete, transformative, on the ground projects. Until that happens, the policy of benign neglect will continue to confuse people about why African leaders remain Western focused for their loans and aid, but unable to transform their countries internally. A huge market for this country if the project is done right. I've given you a teaser of some of the things that I'm interested in. I'm open to your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the three distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, Professor Holm, how, many how much time we have for Q&A? Um, about 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Okay. I open the floor. I do tend to ask a lot of questions. Uh, thank you, entire panel. Uh, it was very insightful. Uh, Dr. Kahlo, a question for you. I was actually born in Soviet Union when it was still Soviet Union, and I was able to escape. And Soviet Union always been meddling in African affairs from the day one, because they saw an opportunity. And West did not realize, and now China is picking up the mantle. So what is your opinion? You already told us what needs to be done, treat in the bilateral. Africa is not one harmonious country. So what is the present administration need to do by going there and engage the department to establish a better relationship to improve the countries and improve life? And at the same time, we gain from it by doing economic work there. Thank you so much for that question. For those of you who may not have the background, if you think about Patrice Lumumba, Patrice Lumumba came to United States first before he went to Soviet Union. If you think about Kwame Nkrumah, Kwame Nkrumah came to US first before he looked at that way, neglecting to work, help people really build their state is the reason that the opportunities existed for this, uh, for Russians, for Chinese to come in. I'll repeat, what do we need to do? I'll give you one concrete example. We have professors, engineers, physicians, nurses, architects in this country, in the UK, in France, who are 70 years or over, who are retiring. How about we engage them for two years? Take this scientist, this architect, say to Mali 
or to Ghana. Engage them. Do not give foreign aid to the government of these countries. Tell them the foreign aid will be spent by Americans or by British, but we are going to tell us what road to construct for you. And when we are done, we put up a sign that says constructed by the US government or the US people. Why don't we look at universities? Let's go to Makerere. All the retiring professors, if you retire here, we will pay you 50% of your salary, which will make you live like a king in Uganda. Go there and teach for two years. Right? There are very strategic, simple things to do. When we talk about winning the heart and minds, the heart and minds of sub-Saharan Africans uh, have always been ready to be won. I hear Boko Haram, in fact, just today, this morning I was woken up by the kidnapping of 280 school children in Kaduna, my home country. And yet, we have the technology. We have the technology in this country. Can we use that technology to fish out these idiots? Everybody in Kaduna will jump up and praise the United States. I know that because on 9-11, I was on my way back to the U.S. at the Lagos airport when I was stopped and told you can't fly back. I said, what happened? New York is under attack. The next thing that happened was they ushered me into the airport, turned on the TV. I spent the next one week going around Lagos, from the airport to the rural areas, Nigerians were crying. They had no idea where New York is. Just the fact that they saw this criminal act, inhumane act, they were crying. They were all Americans. So if we are thinking about where the destabilization of our current international system started, there are markers we need to look at the war in Iraq, not the war in Afghanistan. Bringing down Muammar Gaddafi without placing mm -hmm. another structure, which is why you have increased terrorism flowing to Mali, flowing into Somalia, coming back into Burkina Faso, creating havoc in Chad. These were soldiers that were being paid by Muammar Gaddafi. He is, we have no love for him. He's good, he's dead. But removing him, you require to have put a structure in place and not leave it empty as it <laughs> remains to, to this day. We needed to confront Putin in 2008 when he went into Georgia, not cuddle him and give him opportunity to think the West is not interested. A long answer to your question, I'm sorry. We, we have a question here. Yes. Please, please make sure they're quick questions to get as many as possible. <laughs> Uh, I have a, uh, just a quick question, and it's a very complicated one, but it will only take a one-word response for the panel. China, our enemy or our competitor? Competitor. <laughs> competitor. 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 <laughs> okay, well, that was a quick one. Thank you. Um, hello, I would like to direct my question to Teresa. Um, you talked about China and the complexity of it and how it's like where it's very authoritarian, but there's also some signs where it's not completely like totalitarian. My question is about Taiwan and how we have this like very bizarre relationship with China where they're our competitor and we're very economically intertwined with them, but we also have a lot of animosity towards them, and we're literally afraid of a potential invasion of Taiwan. How, how should the United States government operate its foreign policy in the South China Sea, and specifically Taiwan? And how would Trump or Biden continue their policies? Let me thank you. Thank him for the question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the, the best policy is a combination of kind of 
clear messaging. So like you, uh, Dr. Hart used the example of NATO and that, you know, we will be there to back up Taiwan. So make that crystal clear. And Biden, I think he's not, his handlers don't want him to say things like that, but he's said that a couple of times. At the same time, we need to engage China. And with regard to China-Russian relations, the more we solely treat China as an enemy, the more we kind of push China into a more close relationship with Russia. So I thought it was a good sign that uh, Biden and Xi Jinping spoke in San Francisco on the sides of the APEC conference. I find that a much more uh, productive strategy while at the same time being firm on the other side. Okay, we've got a question here. Um, this is so cool. I've got a million questions for all of you. But um, <laughs> my question is for Dr. Wright. Um, you mentioned that there was kind of this concept of no, be, of there being no viable alternative to um, the CCP right now. But could Taiwan and the Taiwanese government kind of as like the spiritual successor of the nationalist side be considered a viable alternative to the CCP? In mainland China <laughs> right now, no. Um, in theory, Yes. Um, so maybe I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Got a question here. Hello. So I think one of the key topics all of you guys were touching on is international norms and rules and the international institutions that govern them. I was wondering if you guys could talk about how you guys see BRICS Plus impacting those rules and how you see them changing in the next decade. I think, you know, when we think about BRICS, um, you know, these are all countries that have really been moving up, you know, in terms of their economies. They're not now, um, there's been a lot of discussion when you think about the UN Security Council about reform and whether or not, you know, the UN should be, UN Security Council should be expanded, for example. Should Brazil be brought on? Should India be brought on? to speak to the policy of neglect. I mean, the UN Security Council is one of many international institutions that shows you sort of, you know, the legacies of not just colonialism, but also neglect of certain regions of the world. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I don't think that in the immediate future we'll see that movement. Um, but I think these are really powerful players um, economically, but also for when we think about the United Nations General Assembly. So within the General Assembly, you have all sorts of you know, key groupings. I mean, it's such a massive organization. You think of hundreds of countries. And so that has been a really um, excellent group for seeing movement on key issues about uh, labor rights, about dumping. So dumping, thinking of things like agricultural subsidies, um, even movement on climate change. Uh, so I think you know, there's a lot of uh, power there in terms of um, pushing the political agenda, even though we're not necessarily seeing the formal changes and formal reforms that I think some of us would like to see um, you know, in, in these global or international institutions. Okay. Thank you. Well, appreciating the perspective, um, I don't share the optimistic view that China is a uh, competitor, uh, but rather due to internal instability, paranoia becomes more and more uh, bad in some ways, mercantilist in some ways. Um, maybe Dr. Wright, what, what's your, what's outside of China, or outside of Taiwan even, what's the downside worst case scenario that we might see with China? Well, I think it's hard to predict, but without any kind of organized opposition or alternative, I think the best case scenario would be that there would be other top Chinese Communist Party leaders who are more kind of reform oriented, who might take control and move China in a more kind of liberal and open direction, both politically and economically. The worst case scenario is uh, chaos 
where there's no kind of organized leadership. And that's something I find very conser concerning. Or a leader who arises that is even less concerned with providing decent government services to the population than is the case for Xi Jinping. Okay, we're in a lightning round here and we've got limited time. I see one question here and I see the other front here. Oh, okay. oh, thank you, Owen. Uh, wow, what a wonderful panel. Uh, Dr. Kahlo, you, you made a, a wonderful case about the fact that benign neglect w which w allowed Chinese encroachment into Africa. You could probably make the same case uh, in, in Latin America in the post-Cold War era. But you know, I, I think back after the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine by Russia, the former foreign minister of Germany said, you know, we, we did nothing after 2014, and this is what the result was. We just let it go. And I'm, I'm concerned now that today, even, uh, even with, with Ukraine at war, we're not we're not even willing to help there, apparently, in, in the Congress now. And what do you consider the help, for, or, I mean, in terms of the chances that we're going to take steps towards Africa or even Latin America to stop that Chinese encroachment? Thank you. Thank you. This gives me, your question gives me an opp opportunity to say something that has been baffling to me, and that is, I'm not so sure that the US and Western allies actually want Ukraine to win the war against Russia. Here is why. This is the first war in history that I have studied where the weapons to be used are announced in advance. The US always, and Europeans always, tell the world, this is the weapon we are sending to Ukraine. And those weapons arrive six months or so later, which gives Vladimir Putin, with military industrial complex, a, a, the opportunity to actually find antidote to the weapons that are coming. That said, again, the people across the entire sub Saharan Africa where I spent most time and will continue to spend time. They are honestly not interested in China. They are not interested in Russia. You give them an opportunity, they want to go to UK and United States with US as number one destination. Anything American is what they are interested in. You go to South Africa, in spite of our complicity in apartheid in South Africa, the South Africans, to this day, we still like America. That's what they say. It's an intentional recalibration of human relations. That's what will build the world that will keep others out and those that we want in. Promoting democracy in a, a place where war ended just yesterday is not the right approach because people are yet to understand why they fought in the first place. Promoting state capacity, that's what we should be focused on, not this other very nice, valuable, value-oriented public diplomacy. Okay, we have one question here and one more, and I'm gonna have to cut it off after that one, so thank you. Thank you so much for the panel. It was very, very insightful. Uh, my question for you, Dr. Kalu, is do you mind commenting on, um, on how, no, sorry, I got nervous. But do you mind commenting a little bit on how, uh, concerning the case studies of Botswana, Nigeria, and Burkina Faso, uh, what would be the potential effects of um, the United States' complicity on, on my generation and our children's generation, and how can that reflect on uh, the case with Latin America as well? There is something I did not get, the complicity of your generation. Uh, oh, no, 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 it's, it's how it will affect my generation. I mentioned at the beginning, 
of the 1.25 billion people, 40% are very young. These are the people, if we pay attention, are going to be good partners to your generation. These are the people who need to be educated. These are people who need technical skills. These are people who need to be thinking about making money, not joining some jihadist groups. These are people that need to love their countries while welcoming foreigners. The same thing applies to Latin America. We need to think beyond states and focus our attention on the humans. To the extent that we do that, your generation will benefit. I have no doubt about it. Okay. Final I had a question for Dr. Hart. I was wondering if do you draw any similar parallels between Russia's history and actions within Eastern Europe and specifically Ukraine to the actions of other powerful countries around the world, namely China's relationship with Taiwan or the US's influence in the Middle East, particularly current conflict zones? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it depends on which aspect of Russian's behavior you're interested in. I think Congressman Royce this morning made an excellent um, comparison, right? You saw the analogy to, uh, <clears throat> to Napoleon Bonaparte, to other um, autocratic leaders. I mean, I hate to make this comparison explicitly, but Adolf Hitler and others who, uh, who were very focused on power. Um, and I think um, I'm happy to say a lot of people that I've worked with, reminder, this is nothing that I'm saying is in my former government capacity, I'm 100%. <laughs> You know, uh, professor, but my impressions were that people truly understand that, and um, so I, it's useful and helpful to know that there are a lot of folks who have been studying, um, you know, Putin's playbook for a very long time. But unfortunately, yes, we do have, you know, plenty of cases of autocratic leaders who are seeking power and expansion of power at all costs. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank the panel. Oh, uh, truly thanks for every uh, uh, distinguished panelist.